Shaders have a reputation for being a bit of black magic. I know many beginner game maker developers and even experienced game maker developers who have been using the engine for a long time and have done quite a lot of things with it, who have never touched shaders and who are hesitant to begin playing around with shaders. And if you happen to count yourself among those people, then by the end of this video, I'm going to try to convince you that shaders are actually a lot of fun and they're quite cool and they're not something that you should be afraid of. And even if you decide that shader code isn't something that you actually really like writing yourself, hopefully you'll at least have a general sense of what you can do with them. So if you've never heard of shaders before, shaders are in charge of rendering whatever you see in your game. You can use this to do all kinds of crazy things, as opposed to the rest of the code in your game that you're probably familiar with, stuff like the code that you wrote to have the player move around when the player hits a key or whatever. The ultimate goal of a shader is to resolve the colors of pixels. Sometimes people will say things like my game doesn't have any shaders or things to that effect, but that's kind of a misnomer because all game maker games and all games in general in the last, say, 20 years or so will have some kind of default shader or another even if you haven't written one for yourself. And beyond basic rendering, just drawing a sprite to the screen, shaders can also be used for all kinds of other crazy things, like color modification, uh, color inversion, hue shift, uh, brightness and contrast, any kind of like Photoshop filter or a, a blend mode that you might find in an image editing uh, software, any kind of post-processing effect or any kind of uh, effect that you might find in something like Game Maker's layer filters list, that all can be done with a shader. Some more advanced things include, uh, for example, SDF effects such as outlines around shapes, uh, drop shadows around shapes. You can do all kinds of 3D shenanigans with shaders, which is apparently the thing that I'm uh, known for on the internet. Tune shaders, as the name implies, is a shader technique. Uh, palette swapping can be done with shaders, the list goes on. So as much fun as it can be to talk about tune shaders and palette swapping all day, I am going to just get started with some simple examples. So this is a basic game maker project. Uh, right now, I'm just going to be drawing a few sprites to the screen, and I'm drawing the sprite of this tree, this duck, and this dog over just a plain checkered background. If you want to download the sample project, I will have a link to the GitHub repository down in the video description, as always. And right now, we're not drawing any of this with a shader, or as I, uh, as I suggested earlier, we're just drawing this with the Game Maker default shader. We're not really doing anything, anything weird to it right now. So let's change that. I am going to go into the asset browser over here on the side in Game Maker, and I'm going to go right click and create myself a shader. Um, let's give it a name. It's a little bit better than shader one. Uh, let's call it shd underscore shader. Uh, if you want to activate drawing with the shader, we can say shader set shd underscore shader. Uh, when you are finished drawing everything with the shader that you are that you are working with. Uh, we can say shader reset and Game Maker will resume drawing with its, uh, its regular default shader. And we can be on our way. So if I run the game now, uh, it's not going to look any different because the shader that is uh, created Game Maker's default uh, shader, it's, um, this doesn't do anything complicated. It essentially passes over each pixel that's drawn. I'll get more to the terminology in a moment. And it puts it on the screen exactly as it is without any, uh, any kinds of transformation, without any kinds of um, color modification or anything like that. Game Maker's default shader actually does a little bit more than that, but uh, as far as we're concerned today, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So first, let's talk about the anatomy of a shader. So what is all this stuff that was generated uh, automatically when I went and uh, right-click create new shader? So... When you create a shader in Game Maker, it's going to be split into two parts. There's the vertex shader and there's the fragment shader. In modern graphical pipelines, there is a little bit more to it than that. Sometime within the next year or so, Game Maker will be getting access to compute shaders, but that is not something that concerns us right now. Let's just worry about the vertex and fragment shader. And by worry about the vertex shader, I mean that um, all of this is very exciting, especially when you start working with 3D. But again, for basic use, we don't care about the vertex shader, so I'm going to skip all that. That's not to say that it's not important, but I do think the fragment shader is a much better place to start learning about this stuff than the vertex shader. So the first thing you'll notice about all this is that it doesn't look a lot like GML at all. Shaders in Game Maker are written in a language called the OpenGL Shader Language, or GLSL. And other shader languages do exist, some of which you can even uh, use in Game Maker, but GLSL slash GLSLES, it's a long story, I'm just going to call it GLSL. Is, uh, is the default one that you get when you create a new shader, so I'm going to be going with that. I have made a video on HLSL, but there's not really a lot of reasons to use it in Game Maker anymore. So once again, I'm going to invoke the, uh, the don't worry about it rule. 
So if the whole point of a shader is to resolve a color on the screen, it makes sense to first talk about the inputs and the outputs of any given shader program. So uh, for this simple pass-through fragment shader, this is once again a simple shader which basically just um, draws each pixel in whatever sprite or whatever we're drawing without doing anything to it. We have up here v underscore v text chord and v underscore v color. Uh, those are the inputs into the fragment shader. And to be honest, we don't really even need v underscore v color to, um, to have a basic understanding of what's going on here. So I'm just going to actually uh, get rid of that. That line here down on line nine. And gl underscore frag color is the final destination for whatever color we want to resolve when we're drawing something. All of the work that you do in a shader should eventually boil down to figuring out some value to put in gl underscore frag color. This is the color that you're actually going to be drawing on the screen. Things like alpha blending and other kinds of uh, blending notwithstanding. So in that sense, a shader is basically a complicated math function where you have some number of inputs and from there, the shader program is going to perform some series of calculations, which is eventually going to return a single value for the color of the pixel on the screen. In that sense, when you write shader code, you're basically doing art using math. With that established, I think the elephant in the room here is that shaders have what is known as static typing. Shaders are statically typed languages. This is very different from game maker language where any variable you don't have to specify what kind of data is going to be stored in it. You don't have to specify if something is going to be a number or an integer or a string or something else. Hey. But in a shader you do. Whenever you declare a variable in a shader, you need to specify in the code to the shader compiler if that is going to be a number or a vector or a matrix or something else. This isn't the only reason that shaders have a reputation for being weird and arcane and black magic and whatever, but Especially for people who are used to working with languages like GML or JavaScript or Python where um, you don't have to specify the types of variables. Having to declare the types of your variables beforehand in a shader can definitely be one of the things that makes it feel that way. But I promise that once you get used to it after uh, writing a couple of basic shaders, it, it really isn't that bad. So what are the types of variables that you can have in a shader? So for basic use, the main data type that you'll be working with in a shader is going to be a floating point number. So those are numbers that can have fractional parts. In addition to regular floating point numbers, we also have vector types. And vector types are nothing more or less complicated than collections of floating point numbers grouped together. You'll have vector twos, two-dimensional vectors. These are two floating point numbers bundled together. You can think of this as a 2D coordinate with an X and a Y. You'll have vector threes for a three-dimensional vector and vector fours for a four-dimensional vector. A vector three could be used for something like a coordinate in 3D space with an x, y, and z coordinate, or it could represent something like a color with a red, green, and blue uh, color channels. Vector 4 is it's a little bit hard to visualize a 4D coordinate in space, but as long as you stay out of the vertex shader, that's not something you really have to do very much of. You could also use a vector 4 to represent a four-dimensional color component. That's going to be a color with not only red, green, and blue, but also an alpha or transparency channel. And in fact, a vector 4 is uh, what GL frag color is. That's the uh, the output of the fragment shader is going to be a vector 4 representing a color which has a red, green, and blue color component as well as an alpha component. Moving on from vector types, we also have matrix types. The word matrix is one of those weird Latin nouns that ends in ix and instead of the plural form being matrices, it would instead be matrices. So if in the future you hear me or someone else say the word matrices out loud, that's where it comes from. You can think of these as 2D arrays or perhaps vectors containing vectors. Matrices are used for all kinds of numerical transformations, so transformations in 3D space, transformations in color space if you ever wanted to convert between red, green, blue, and hue, saturation, and value, that kind of thing. But once again, for basic use, you're not going to see very much of that. If hearing the word matrix brings back bad memories of Algebra 2 in high school, then don't worry, you're safe. Aside from floating point numbers, shaders do support integral data types, so integers, uh, numbers that are only whole numbers, no decimal. You can also use vectors of not only floating point numbers, but vectors of integers. But that's not something you need to use very often. I only myself rarely use integers and shaders, and I don't think I've ever actually needed to use a, uh, a vector containing integers. And last but not least, we have texture samplers. The texture samplers are what contain the actual image information that you're trying to draw. This could be a sprite that you're trying to draw in Game Maker. This could be a font, because in Game Maker, fonts are stored on textures. This could be a surface if you're trying to draw a surface, a tile map if you're trying to draw a tile map. Whatever graphical information that goes with whatever you're trying to draw in a shader will be stored in a sampler. 
Game Maker will actually set this up for us. Uh, GM underscore base texture is, as the name implies, the base texture of whatever you're trying to draw. If you are trying to draw, for example, this duck sprite, the actual pixel information when you go to draw it will be stored and can be accessed using GM underscore base texture. So there's a whole lot more to shaders than this, but this is all you really, really need to know just to start out. So now that we know the basic lay of the land, let's start playing around with these values so that we can do something interesting with color, shall we? So first things first, when you want to actually extract some color information from a, uh, from a texture, from whatever you're trying to draw, so a sprite, a tile map, a surface, whatever. That is known as sampling from a texture. That's why the um, texture data types are known as sampler 2Ds in GLSL. And to do that, we're going to use a function called texture2D, and the texture2D function is going to take two arguments. One of them is going to be the sampler2D itself, so gm underscore base texture in our case, because that's what GameMaker has set up for us. And the texture coordinate, which is going to be a vector2. This vector2 is going to be two floating point numbers, which range between usually 0 and 1, with 0 being one corner of the texture and 1 being the opposing corner of the texture. Uh, this is one of the inputs to the fragment shader. The fragment shader is going to be run for each pixel that you're trying to draw, or in GLSL parlance, uh, they're called fragments, but normal people just call them pixels. If you imagine sampling from a texture as going into something like Microsoft Paint and using the eyedropper tool. Uh, where's the eyedropper tool? This one here. And then um, whichever color you select under the eyedropper tool being the, uh, the color that's, uh, that's returned from that function. Uh, the texture coordinate is going to be the, um, well, the coordinate in the image, uh, wherever you select the, uh, the eyedropper tool from. Now, there is one, um, one difference from the way that shaders think about texture coordinates and the way that, like, you know, image editing software and the way that, you know, normal people think about texture coordinates, which is that, um, in shaders, a texture coordinate will range from 0 to 1. Uh, instead of from zero to like whatever the dimension of the image is. So this tree sprite is 64 pixels by 64. And you might expect the um, like the upper left to be zero and the bottom right to be like 64, 64. But in shaders, the texture coordinates are always going to range from zero in one corner to one in the opposite corner. And there's a few reasons for this. Uh, the biggest one that I can think of being that when you um, when you have texture coordinates all being relative, if you have them all existing in a range from 0 to 1, then it doesn't matter how big the image that you're trying to draw is, you can treat them all the same. Uh, so 0 will be one corner, 1 will be the other, and like the middle will be 0.5, for example, and it doesn't matter if your sprite is 32 by 32 or like 1,000 by 1,000. That's something to keep in mind. That's another thing that can trip people up when they get started with shaders for the first time. Uh, likewise, when you deal with the actual color values, color values in shaders, also, um, instead of ranging from 0 to 255 on each of the red, green, and blue color channels, which is, again, what a lot of people are used to, color values in shaders are always going to range from 0 to 1. So with 0 being, well, 0, and 1 being the, uh, the maximum amount of color that you can have on that channel. And once again, there's a few reasons for this. It actually makes the math a little bit easier when you do things like multiply two color values together. It also makes it a little bit easier to work with things like HDR, in which case uh, colors can have a range that somewhat exceeds uh, 0 to 1. All this is to say that while you might be used to, in image editing software, thinking about, for example, a light green color being color values 192, 255, 192, in a shader, instead that same light green is going to be represented by 0 0.75, uh, 1.0, 0 0.75. Again, this is definitely something that I've seen trip a lot of people up, but there are good reasons for it to be this way, and once you get used to it, once you've written a few shaders, it becomes second nature. And the same is true for alpha or transparency in, um, in shader color values, by the way. Instead of going from, for example, 0 to 100%, uh, alpha will, like the other color channels, just range from 0 to 1. That seems to be more intuitive to people than uh, 0 to 1 for colors, but just thought I'd mention it. All right, so once we've taken our eyedropper tool and sampled from our... Um, from our tree sprite or whatever, uh, we can start playing around with these values. Uh, if you want to, um, for example, declare a variable uh, containing a color, uh, this texture2d function, like I said, is going to return a color, which is going to be a vector4. 
uh, we can declare a variable by saying vec for, let's call it sample color is going to equal the result of this. And we can access the, uh, the red, green, blue, and alpha color channels inside this vector for uh, using the dot operator. Uh, we can say sample color dot R, G, B, and alpha. And um, if you think of a vector for as an object which contains four floats, uh, the way that you would access the individual values inside that object is with uh, dot red, dot green, dot blue, or dot alpha. Uh, you can also use x, y, z, or w. A vector for dot, for example, r and a vector for dot x are both going to uh, contain the same value, so this is always going to be the first value in a vector. Uh, same for green, or same for uh, vector dot g and vector dot y, so on and so forth. Uh, naturally, a vector 2 will only contain uh, x and y or r and g, a vector 3 will only contain x, y, z or r, g, b, and a vector 4 will contain all four. Hey. And I, uh, I think there's actually like another set of um, set of just letters that you can use to access these color channels, but I don't remember what they are. I think it's PQRS. And uh, lastly, this is not important right now, but it's just a very fun word, and I think you all should know it. But it is also possible to access uh, components like a, a subvector inside another vector. Uh, if you wanted, for example, only the red, green, and blue components of a, of a color from a vector 4, you could say dot RGB, and this itself would return. Uh, like this, a vector 3 containing the red, green, and blue uh, components of the specter. And the technical name for this is swizzling, which I think is excellent. You can mess around, you can uh, swizzle the... That sounds amazing to say out loud. Uh, you can... Um... You can play around with the ordering of these, and this will uh, reverse, the, reverse the color components of a vector. Uh, if you wanted a vector 3, which contains like... only the red value three times, you can say dot R, R, R. Again, that's not really important right now, but I just wanted an excuse to say the word swizzling out loud. And also, I, uh, I think I said this before, but just in case I didn't, uh, if, you want a, um, if you want a floating point number in a variable, let's call it some number, uh, you might want to declare float some number equals one, but uh, the shader compiler will not like this. Uh, the shader compiler will think that this one is supposed to be an integer, which it is not, and it is trying to put inside a variable which is supposed to contain a float, so it won't let you. Um, if you want to declare a, um, a floating point number like this, you need to specify either 1.0 or if it's um, if it does have a fractional part, 1.5, but um, all floating point numbers in a shader need to have a decimal point. There are some specific rules about things like doing math between two numbers of different types, but I'm not going to get into that right now. You could also, back to vectors, uh, you can create a vector by using um, vector3 as essentially a constructor function. If you say some vector equals a vector three, uh, let's say, uh, let's give this three numbers, uh, maybe zero, 1.5, and like, I don't know, 3.14, that's a nice number. Uh, this will give you a vector three containing these three values on the uh, X, Y, and Z, or red, green, and blue color components. And of course, uh, you can, always assign individual values to a component of a vector. So we can say some vector equals this, and then we can change like it's a, uh, it's green channel to like two point, I don't know, nine, nine or something like that. That's perfectly legal. You can do all the other common uh, math operations that you'd expect. You can do plus equals, minus equals, multiplied by equals, uh, things like that on values like this, and it will work. Uh, there's also a handful of all of the common math functions that you might expect, so things like absolute value, uh, to get the absolute value of a number, uh, sine, cosine, tangent, all the trig functions, hey. uh, square roots, exponentiation, logarithms, things like that. We do have logarithms and shaders, right? We do. All right. And lastly, 
Uh, you can also do pretty much all of these math operations on not only individual numbers, but also on vectors themselves. So uh, if you wanted to, for example, say some vector dot RG, so the first two um, components in a vector and uh, game maker will not syntax highlight just dot RG, but you are allowed to do it. Uh, you could say some vector dot RG plus equals, um, let's say uh, a vector two of like, I don't know, 10.0, 20.0, I'm just making up numbers. Uh, this will work just fine. This will add a vector two containing uh, 10 and 20 to the first and second components of this vector. You could also simply say some vector uh, as a vector three itself, like this. These are the basic math operations that you can do in a shader. All right, there's more to this, but these are the, uh, as a broad overview, those are the basic things you can do with math in a shader. So getting back to messing around with color values, uh, if you wanted to take a, uh, like an image, I guess I already closed it. If you wanted to take like an image like this and Let's start really simple. Let's start by Let's start by just removing the red color from uh, all three of the sprites that we're drawing. So I can take the sample color that we're getting from GM base texture. I can say sample color dot red equals zero. That's going to remove the red from each of the pixels that we're drawing and GL underscore frag color is going to be equal to uh, the sample color. This is going to um, set the final final value of the shader program to to this. We can run the game now, and now we're going to see each of the sprites on the screen without any red in them. So we've got the tree. The tree didn't change much because the green leaves in the tree don't have a lot of red. Uh, the duckling turned greener because yellow is, at least in the red, green, blue color model, yellow is composed of red and green. Uh, the duck I mean, the dog, uh, the blue part of the dog didn't change much. The red part of the dog, obviously, like the red hat, is now pretty dark because red was the, the main color in that part of the sprite. Remove the red and there's not much left. Uh, you could also do this with, uh, you, could, you could send this the other way. You could set the red to um, basically 100% and make all the sprites turn redder. All right. Uh, you could, let's say you could darken the color. by multiplying, uh, you can say multiplied by red, green, blue, multiplied by, um, let's say a vector three of say, oh, 0.5. I'll just do 0.5 on all three color channels. By the way, uh, you do see this a lot. If you are trying to construct a vector which has the same value on all of its, uh, on all of its components, you could simply say uh, vector three of a single value of this, and this will put 0.5 on all three components of a vector three. Uh, you can also multiply vectors by scalars, by single numbers, like this. Uh, this will have the same effect as saying red, green, blue multiplied by a vector three of, of that. And uh, this is a little bit more, th the former is obviously a little bit more concise, so that's generally what you see. I believe it's also more efficient. So we have now darkened uh, each of these guys by, um, by 50%. Uh, if you wanted to... If you wanted to make them all uh, pure black, you could set them all to zero. Uh, if you wanted to play with transparency, uh, you could make the image partially transparent by multiplying the alpha by 0.5. Now we've got a, a gray silhouette. Or if you didn't want a gray silhouette, you could see that we've got, um, uh, you could comment out the the line setting is all to zero, and now we have our images 50% transparent. We can play around with the colors. And um, lest you think I forgot about the V underscore V color that was originally in, in the shader being multiplied by the color that we were sampling from the texture. If you do things with vertex buffers, and if you do things with the vertex shader, you could really use this for whatever you want. But uh, when Game Maker draws a sprite, V underscore V color is the just the color that's blended with a sprite if you're, if you're doing that in GML. And just like we were multiplying vectors by different things a minute ago in code, uh, V underscore V color is a color which you can multiply by the color that is sampled from the texture. And if you were to uh, like draw a sprite extended and um, 
like include a, a blending color of like blue or green or magenta or something like that in um, in Game Maker, then uh, when you come over here to the fragment shader, when you multiply the texture by that value, that you would be basically blending the uh, the sample color by blue or green or magenta. By default, it's white, so uh, white is kind of the uh, the multiplicative identity as far as colors go, because it, white has a value of one. When you multiply anything by one, you get the original value. All right. I really don't want this feeder to be too long. I don't want to implement too many crazy effects, but you can, you can do a bunch of things in shaders just by playing around with math. If you wanted to invert a color, uh, inverting a color is the same as subtracting it, each color value from, um, from one. So if you wanted to say sampled color is a vector three of 1.0 minus I'm going to want that to be sample color RGB because inverting the uh, transparency would, would kind of be a whole thing and it wouldn't really look very good. But if I run this line of code, if I subtract the red, green, and blue from, uh, from one, we're going to have a difference and we're going to, this is actually, uh, all right. I was going to say that's brighter than it should have been. And that's because we're uh, still modifying the brightness up up above, uh, we've got a negative. If you were to like take a picture with a film camera of something, and then if you were to develop it and look at the negative, this is what it would look like. If you were to go into like Photoshop and take a negative of an image, this is what it would look like. Uh, this is all a negative is. As the name implies, we are basically taking each of the colors and reversing them. So a low value on a color channel becomes high, a high value becomes low. All right, that's pretty cool. So I think I'm going to end this off here. I have made many, many videos on this YouTube channel about shaders in Game Maker. So if you're interested in any of the, any specific shader effects, I've made videos on things like Photoshop filters, grayscale, blur. I've uh, done a whole bunch of 3D stuff. So if you actually do care about the vertex shader, I've, uh, I've got plenty of videos on that. I actually made a, uh, another introduction to shader videos about three years ago, which was more focused on the vertex shader because that was part of a series of videos that was more aimed at 3D stuff. But, People have been asking me for ages and ages and ages to make a video on shaders that's just about like, just about this. So I decided that it would be a good idea to have a video that was more like this for people who don't actually care about 3D. I hope this is something that does the trick. Before I go, lastly, I would like to just shout out a few other shader related resources for Game Maker on the internet. If you thought this video was helpful, that's great. But if you didn't like my presentation style or whatever, or if you just were interested in something that I didn't cover here, uh, there's a... Um, there's quite a bit of other learning material for shaders on the internet. Uh, first, I would like to mention Zigthops 3's... Dude, what is your username? Anyway, Zigthop 3's Basic Shaders. Uh, this is actually where I learned shaders the first time. I basically just took a collection of shaders that was on the Game Maker Marketplace and took them apart to see how they worked. Since then, he has taken them off the Game Maker Marketplace because the Game Maker Marketplace is a mess and rehosted them on GitHub. And I will have a link to that GitHub repository down in the video description. This contains a bunch of just basic effects. A lot of the things that I mentioned that you could do with shaders, color adjustment, blurs, brightness and contrast, diffraction patterns, other kinds of post-processing. Similarly, uh, the Major League version of Zigtop 3... Please don't make me say his name out loud again. But um, PPFX, Post-Processing FX by uh, Foxy of Jungle. This is a paid asset, but it contains just oodles and oodles of different... Uh, visual effects, different post-processing effects that you might care about in your game. The list of things that this asset pack contains alone is longer than anything that I ever wrote in high school. If you're interested in things like blogs or written tutorials, uh, Xor is the current reigning shader god of Game Maker. He's got himself a, uh, a mailing list slash blog in which he goes over basic shader things, such as how vectors work, how uh, matrices work, uh, random number generation in shaders, things like that. On the YouTube side, a YouTube user named Reverend Greg hasn't been active for several years now, which is a shame, but he was the YouTube channel that got a lot of other people started with shaders over the years. I'll have a link to his channel down below as well. And last but not least, if you do want to dive into the deep end and get started with 3D stuff in Game Maker, I have dozens and dozens and dozens of videos on things such as basic camera setup and 3D lighting and all kinds of other things on this YouTube channel. And there's also a... Uh, a very handy GitHub Pages site uh, dedicated to 3D game shaders for beginners.
This one isn't game maker centric. I don't know the person who wrote this, but it does contain a rundown of uh, all kinds of basic lighting effects and also some more advanced things such as screen space, ambient occlusion, and uh, reflections and, and other 3D game effects. So that's it. My name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games. I try to post about two game dev videos a week, one tutorial tutorial like this, and one let's make a game, currently a 3D Zelda-like wizard game. So if any of that appeals to you, feel free to subscribe. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute to the channel, links to that can be found in all the usual places. And if you wanted to contribute, I definitely would appreciate it. Otherwise, I hope you all found this useful. Shaders are really cool, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Zenjamin, Vitro V, Square Crow, Sindra Larson, Manta Ray, Game Maker, Edward Holt, and DJ Gibbles for supporting these videos. If you want to contribute to the channel, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.